Good day. Welcome to Westchester Talk Radio, westchestertalkradio.com. I'm John Marino. We are produced by Shark Creative, made possible by Robeson Oil, the house that service built by Lapolis Electric. Don't be left in the dark. Get Lapolis by Hightower, Westchester, managing your wealth to a fiduciary standard by White Plains Hospital and by Michael Labriola, landscape design and construction of our month, along with Tompkins, Mayapak Bank. We are joined by Westchester County Legislator Mary Jane Shimsky, Democratic Majority Leader representing the 12th District. And that covers the River Towns area from Hastings up to the Tappan Zee Bridge and part of Greenberg as well. Mary Jane Shimsky, the county board, issued a statement about a week ago when the revelations of Attorney General James's report about Governor Cuomo came out that he should resign immediately. And now the governor apparently has done the deed. He says he will resign effective in two weeks. I know you had called for his resignation. What happens from here now? Well, at this point, uh, Lieutenant Governor Hochul will become our next governor. Um, I've had some contact with her. I know people who have had more contact with her than I have. Um, she is a very capable person. Um, she is genuinely concerned about the people of this state. And I know that she knows she's got a lot to do because of course so many things had been put on hold um, during the whole pendency of what was going to happen to the, to the governor once uh, the attorney general's report came out and was um, more incriminatory, more incriminatory, more um, inculpa inculpatory of the government of the governor than um, I think just about anyone had expected. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things she's going to have to deal with right away is how we deal with uh, the Delta variant of the coronavirus, especially with schools scheduled to reopen next month. Um, there have been news reports talking about how school districts felt loss at sea essentially because they had not been hearing anything from the state in terms of guidance on how to approach and deal with the issue. So she's got a lot to do there. She's got a lot to do to establish her government. And um, I'm sure because this August really does seem to be such a slow news month, John. I heard, yeah. Um, <laughs> that we'll um, certainly see what else um, comes up. But um, she is as well prepared as anyone in the state to take it all on. You bring up a good point about schools and COVID. And by the time Kathy Hochul really sits down and looks at the meat and potatoes of the job, and if Andrew Cuomo is still in office two more weeks by the time Kathy Hochul officially takes over, we'll be up against September, up against the opening of schools right then. She's not going to have a lot of time to formulate a plan, even starting today. That's true. Although, remember, there is an awful lot that was done the last school year um, under the emergency declaration. Of course, that emergency declaration was uh, rescinded earlier this summer when uh, we were still all full of hope that the uh, virus was behind us. So we do have some options already on a shelf somewhere. We also have some real life experience as to how those various options worked and did not work. So she's certainly not starting from square one on this. What's the impression you get locally in Westchester in your district and around the county from schools, from school districts and administrations about being COVID prepared come September? Well, a lot of it depends on exactly where your district is. Um, I, I think that there are some districts, and I'm sure the further north and the further west you go in the state, it's probably even more true. Wherever you have substantial movements saying, we don't want our children masked, we don't want social distancing, we want everything to go back exactly as it was, um, 
that's very hard on a school district. And having some backup from the State Department of Health and um, someone like the governor who supervises the State Department of Health um, obviously is a huge benefit to them as they try to move forward and they try to protect their staff and they try to protect their children and their children's families. Mm -hmm. We see the COVID numbers around the county and again, they kind of fall in line the way they've been all throughout with the COVID increase around the county, the Delta variant specifically amongst basically those who are not vaccinated. And again, we see the Southern more urban parts of the county with much higher numbers than the Northern parts of the county, which are a lot more wide open. Does this all of this feed into an overall philosophy about how we approach COVID right now in Westchester too? And we talked about before how the needs of one part of the county are not always what other parts of the county might need to have. Absolutely. Right yeah. Um, I think, well, there are, there are several things that kind of have to be done at once. One is, since we know from the experience in other regions of the country, that children are getting hit harder by this virus, that this variant of the virus than from, from prior iterations. And since no one under the age of 12 is allowed to get vaccinated yet, and we only have a small percentage of ages 12 through 17 vaccinated, um, we are going to really have to deal with the school issue. And it's absolutely critical. Parents can talk all they want, but a lot of people have talked all around the country until their children have ended up on ventilators or their spouses have died and they're suddenly faced to raise children on their own with their chief breadwinner gone. Um, so that has to be taken care of right away. The other thing that really has to be taken care of is dealing with the disparity in vaccination rates. The county has actually done a lot the last several months to get vaccines into various communities. Um, for example, there are parts of the southern part of Westchester where a lot of people just don't have access to transportation. And in the beginning, when the rest of us were driving to the county center and lining up or driving to pop-up clinics at various high schools and so on and lining up, there were a lot of people who work more than full-time, working poor, who did not have cars and would have to take two or three buses each way. Um, obviously, that's a, pro that's a problem for those people and we have to make it more convenient we also have a lot of people of color who distrust the vaccines, quite frankly, because so much of the um, bad acts of the medical profession within those communities in prior decades. So we have to be able to reach out to those people. And we also still have a substantial number of people who are just part of the general ideological COVID denial and vaccine denial, and I'm 23 and healthy, so why do I want to take a chance um, with the vaccine? Well, now it's turning out that taking a chance with COVID is really, really a big problem mm -hmm. because we, there is an article in the Washington Post a few weeks ago from a doctor, in Al, which interviewed a doctor in Alabama who said she would sit there with people in their 20s young adults, just as they were about to get put on a ventilator. And for, the, for those of you who may not be as informed on some of this in your audience, if you're going on a ventilator, there's a pretty darn good chance you're going to die. It's well over 50%, 75%, 80%, somewhere in there. They start crying and they say, please give me the vaccine now. And she says, sorry, it's too late. Because of course, in order for the vaccine to really protect you at all takes a minimum of, of about two weeks and to get full protection takes a lot longer than that. We don't want that happening to our people here. And 
our county government and our local governments have been really aggressive about getting information out and getting pop-up clinics out. And we're just going to have to continue redoubling the efforts. Do we need to scare the vaccine hesitant into going to get a shot? Those especially by ideology who say, no, I'm not going to do this. You're not going to put something in my body that I'm going to regret a few years down the road. And yet, as, as, if, they're, as if they're going it. to end up not regretting the COVID. Uh, like I try to explain to people, I'd rather take my chances with getting a vaccine, which I have, as opposed to 4 million people at least dead around the world. I uh, prefer not to be part of that group. Absolutely. And, and the other end of it is it's not just for you. It's for members of your family. And it's for members of your entire community, because what we're finding with the Delta variant is it's much more contagious. It spreads a lot more easily. And it even spreads very easily through people who have asymptomatic infections. So to me, it's not just a public health issue, John, it's also a moral issue. And so many people who are anti-vaccine and the biggest group, at least among the white community, are very religious people. And all I could say to them is, your God and nobody's God is in favor of their adherence wildly going through communities and spreading dangerous diseases among people go back and not only reflect on what is true and what is not true about this virus, but go back and reflect on what's true and not true, true about your religious tradition as well. Really reflect on this and, you know, use your conscience. Think about yourself and think about others. Mary Jane Shimsky, County Legislator, 12th District, the County Majority Leader, Democrat, Represents the area along the river towns from Hastings up to the Tappan Zee Bridge and part of Greenberg too. Mary Jane Shimsky, your best estimation at this moment. Do you think schools will be fully reopened in September or is this still a day-to-day -day proposition? Let's put it this way, John. If I were putting $20 in the office pool today, I, I would put it on the schools fully reopening. Although if the numbers among children keep getting worse, who knows? So I might put the $20 in. I would not put next month's maintenance payment in. And this could all change. Obviously, we could fully reopen and then the numbers really go south and then everybody's learning from home again. That could happen, correct? Um, and that's certainly something we want to avoid because obviously if those numbers go up, we are dealing with a large number of children who risk long-term disability, permanent disability, or worse. Governor Cuomo's situation, as you pointed out, tied to all of this, yeah. getting reports that even though the governor says he will resign, that impeachment might proceed anyway. Is this legally possible? Well, as long as he's in office, it's my understanding that you can try to remove him from office. Now, I, I think Getting a trial and a conviction in two weeks is, is not probably possible anyway. Might be tough to do. It, oh, it would definitely be very tough to do. Yeah. And logistically, I just don't think it's possible. But if there's a concern that the governor may go back on this, um, People may want to continue moving forward anyway, especially given what's at stake come September. Could it be that people are floating this idea of impeachment anyway, just to make sure the governor follows through and does leave office in two weeks? I have no inside knowledge on this, but it's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. So the state here, if Kathy Hochul is the governor now, two, three weeks down the road or whatever it takes after Andrew Cuomo steps away and Kathy Hochul does step in, what does she need to do besides deal with COVID, the schools issue, and more obviously, what else is on her plate? Well, she's going to have to knit the state government back together. 
Um, I think there will be a fair amount of goodwill coming her way because of the difficult circumstances in which she's um, entering the office, which is always a good thing. But um, that still takes a certain amount of doing. We are in the midst of multiple um, existential crises, which go beyond the state level. You know, we're dealing with COVID, obviously. We're also dealing with climate change. We see what's going on um, around the world. It's right. not. It's not just California. It's not just the west of the Rockies part right. of this country. And we feel Turkey, that change here too in this region. Turkey, Greece, Italy. Right. Um, it's starting to happen everywhere. And the thing is, I know in California, usually those wildfire seasons would, lately we're reaching their peak in like September, October. It's, it's August and we already have like, I, I heard today it was something like double the land area of Rhode Island that's right. been burned out with no end in sight. And this is so throughout we, the Northwest, Oregon and Washington state too. And you have those huge heat waves in, in a region of the country which doesn't even have air conditioning because they've never needed it before. Mm -hmm. And you also have the issues of protecting our democracy. Um, you have a movement in this country, which I will be perfectly honest, John, I will not characterize as anything less than fascist. And they are working on mobilizing those people to try to reinstate Trump in office either later this month or in September. There is a lot going on that's really problematic that can really cause serious, serious problems for this state and everyone who lives in it. Um, at the same time, there are opportunities. It looks as if the United States Congress is finally getting its act together on infrastructure and infrastructure is a very important issue in New York State. Um, we have 10% of our bridges, which are in very bad shape. Right. And the further north you go, the worse it gets. Um, we have problems with broadband access and improved broadband access can be a huge engine for economic development in rural areas, in inner cities, and so on. And so in addition to the bad stuff, we also have good stuff. We also have a lot of opportunity that... Um, now that we'll have a governor who is less distracted by um, having to hold himself accountable to, to the law um, can hopefully get good things done for us. Kathy Hochul will be in a position where she can govern instead of, like you said, having to pay attention to so many other different things as Andrew Cuomo has had for a while now. It's almost 2022. There's a Governor's race and election next year, 15 months away from right now. Is this an opportunity for Kathy Hochul, if she would like to be governor beyond January of 2023, to establish herself, to let the people of New York know that we can put the state in her hands next time around at the polls in 2022? Um, I, I think that's relatively non-controversial that if she goes in and she does a good job, it certainly does put her in good stead if she were to run for a full term as governor, there's no question about that. Um, I also think that we've had, obviously wherever you have problems like this that result in a resignation of your chief executive officer, it creates uh, you know, real serious issues going down to the core. And I think whatever the party does about the governor's race has to be thoughtful and it has to be resolved amicably and expeditiously because this is not a good time for the state to end up being, divi being divided. And we all know, John, that that's always been the rap on Democrats, right? The circular firing squad. Right. We can't agree with each other, so we always go after each other. And then if we want unified government, we bring in the Republicans. Well, we have to show, especially with all of the crises surrounding us and the Democrats' record on those versus the Republicans' record on those, we have to make sure that we come, 
we go forward very quickly in 2020 as a unified party. Bottom line, how has all of this affected Westchester, all of the machinations of the governor as of late, and how could all of this affect the county in the months ahead? Well, we are in pretty, pretty good hands. Um, our county executive and our board of legislators has been working very well together. Um, financially, we're in good shape, especially with the money we've gotten from the CARES Act and the other federal um, programs to help uh, cope with the economic repercussions of the coronavirus. We are in as good a shape as anyone in the state to weather these things. But we have a lot of work to do too, and it will be great to have a partner who will help us with the technical public health aspects and will help us with any economic issues or um, public relations issues vis-a-vis -vis the virus that um, get more and more urgent as the case numbers grow. County Legislator Mary Jane Shimsky, 12th District Representative, Majority Democratic Leader on the County Board. Her area encompasses the Rivertown's portion of the county from Hastings up to the Tappan Zee Bridge and into parts of Greenberg too. Mary Jane Shimsky, we thank you as always. Let's talk again soon. Oh, uh, it, it would be a pleasure, John. Much appreciated, Mary Jane Shimsky here on Westchester Talk Radio, westchestertalkradio.com. Produced by Shark Creative, this is the Cup of Joe political show. I'm John Marino, and we are made possible by Robeson Oil, the house that service built. By Lipolis Electric, don't be left in the dark. Get Lipolis by Hightower Westchester, managing your wealth to a fiduciary standard. By White Plains Hospital and by Michael Labriola and Sons, landscape design and construction of our monk, along with Tompkins Mayapack Bank. We thank you here at Westchester Talk Radio, and we also point out to you that you can catch all of our Westchester, Rockland, Putnam and Duchess, Orange, and Fairfield County programming on our YouTube channel. And we also have a new Westchester Talk Radio app. You can take it with you. Download it. Go anywhere, any place with it. It's called Westchester Talk.